All right, young scholars, we have now hit the 1022 lecture where we begin JavaScript. So after spending the past three weeks discovering cascading style sheets, or CSS, we jump into another type of code which helps us enhance HTML called JavaScript. And as I've done at the start of each of these three sections, I have an additional content section folder of other PowerPoints you may want to look through regarding this topic. So JavaScript is embedded in HTML files, just like CSS is. However, instead of using the style tag, with JavaScript, we use the script tag instead. And instead of .css for a CSS file, our JavaScript files are saved as .js. Now, JavaScript is very similar to Java. So functions make up the majority of what JavaScript does. And like similar programming languages, you can comment out a single line of code using the slash slash. So as I just mentioned, it's like Java, it uses functions. It's interpreted by the browser, but not compiled like a programming language is. And it's complementary to HTML, used for dynamic web pages and form validation primarily. And it's operating system and browser independent. As I previously mentioned, you use the script tag instead of the style tag. And if you were to save it externally, it would be a .js file. As I'll mention multiple times throughout these slides, similar to using uh, cascading style sheets externally, in this case, instead of style source scripts, it's script source, and then your JavaScript file .js close out that script tag. So a reminder from HTML, divide or div allows us to create spaces or divisions within various items within your HTML file. Span is very similar. Essentially creates spaces in between paragraphs and other sections of the body as well. So as I already mentioned, very similar to Java, but it allows for client-side code execution. So you can make the web page do something, calculate you know, a multiplication program similar to what you would do in Java or a Python programming language. And here you can see it's primarily working similarly to the functions you saw to some degree with CSS. So in this case, all we're doing is writing to the document, your HTML page, our first JavaScript. So if you were to copy and paste this code into your WYSIWYG, it would simply create a button that says, click me. Button on click, my first function, function, click me, button. So you're just creating a button that has an on-click. If the function were still, or if the .js file were still uploaded to the WYSIWYG editor, you have gotten an alert when you click that button that says our test works. For some reason, that specific .js file, along with some of these others, are no longer uploaded to the WYSIWYG editor. So if you click that button, you may not get a response. So what does an on-click do? Well, it basically allows us to click some area, whether it be a text or more commonly a button. Once you click it, it does something. So certain pages, you may be able to click a button and make the text larger. You may be able to click a button to change the language. Those are the most common you might see on a specific website. And here is an example of another on-click. Like slide seven, the .js file no longer appears to be uploaded to the WYSIWYG, but this code would simply allow you to change the size 
of the spacing or div division in between the various sections of your HTML. You can change it, go back, or change the entire document. So here we simply see the three functions used to change that div size. So all of those functions that you see here on slide 10 are what is being called here on slide nine. Div change, div chain back, doc change. So div change changes the spacing of the divisions. Change back reverts back to what you had initially. And then doc change, the document has changed. So on slide 11, this example code allows us to switch from one CSS code preset with background color, text color, et cetera, changing on the click. So you notice here we have two different styles.css. When you switch style, click that on click, it would switch from this styles.cs to the other styles2.css. Unfortunately, again, it does not appear the WYSIWYG still has these uploaded. But for example, this first color background might be orange. And if you click the on click, it changes to a background color of red, perhaps. And here you have the JavaScript function, which many websites now have that allow you to switch to a mobile version. So you might have a default, a default style and then an option to click for a mobile style. So for example, somebody's on their phone or iPad, you may want to provide them with the option to click and make the web page more compatible for their specific device. So as I mentioned, JavaScript is primarily based on functions. Code can be written as a block or code that will execute once or as the functions are gone through. So here's an example of how those functions work. The function syntax is function. You name your function, parenthesis, parenthesis, bracket. You put in whatever your code is, closed by the semicolon with the closing bracket. So for example, function, my addition function, your two parameters here, A and B, bracket, return A plus B. So within your code, you'll have it somewhere where you'll input a value for A, an input, a value for B, and then it will return whatever the two values are added together. As mentioned on the second slide, I believe, you use slash slash to comment out a single line of code. However, if you want to comment out multiple lines of code, you'd use slash asterisk, put all the lines of code there, and then underneath it, asterisk, and then the opposite slash. So you could have, let's say, 12 lines of code slashed out and commented out as you needed to. So now here, slides 16 through 22, simply cover JavaScript that's tied to Java functions. So you're more than welcome to look through that as you so choose. Another interesting aspect that JavaScript allows us to do is AJAX, which is simply a combination of JavaScript and XML, but it's asynchronous, hence the A. Why is it asynchronous though? It allows time for the server to process the request and return the results when it's complete. In other words, you get it when you need it. It's not at a specific time, you get it as you need it once you look through that website. So we basically have a request or response from the server that we get back, and it's either text or XML properties through that request object. So if it's simple text, it gives us back. If it's XML, it gives us back the data we need. Some of you have probably heard of cookies before, but in case you have not, it's a small piece of data sent from a website and stored in a user's web browser while using a browser website. 
when the user browses the same website in the future, as long as that cookie hasn't expired yet, it'll be quicker to upload that specific web page. So within a cookie, if you create it using JavaScript, it'll have a name, which is the, whatever the name you set for the cookie, a value, an expiration date, a path, where is the cookie stored, the domain, what is your domain? The security associated with how you're encrypting, encrypting that info, but it only stores small amounts of data. They're available in JavaScript only to the domain used when the cookie was created. So you can't have a cookie and set it up on, let's say you set it for ESPN.com. You can't use that same cookie for, let's say, Bavesh.com. So you'll notice here on slides 27 through 29, the functions you would specifically use for setting and getting a cookie. And there's an explanation on slide 28 as to what we've done. Here on slide 30, you're asked to explain how many times the following while loop will run and what the value of I will be when it is complete when called with my while function two and eight. So you have this function, you put in two for A and eight for B, var equals one, var counter is one, while the counter is less than or equal to B, I equals I times A, and then the counter increases by one, as long as it's less than or equal to B, and then return I. So go ahead and think that through as you're watching this. But then the answer will be on slide 31 if you get stumped. So important notes, XML works well with JavaScript because XML stores data and JavaScript uses functions and can retrieve that data as needed. As you just saw, JavaScript can help us create in getting or setting a cookie as we need if we need to small store small amounts of data from a web page. The expire function is used to set an expiration date for our cookie. And they're always available in the same directory that the cookie was created in, whatever the path may be. So here on slide 33, you're provided an example of how using both XML and JavaScript is done within HTML code. So we've externally linked a JavaScript file here within the JS folder on our web server, and we've used it to unload the data from our XML file address book. So there are some concerns when using cookies. They can be overwritten in the browser. Now, some individuals allow this and others can be edited by opening the file which stores the cookies. You have to be very skilled to do either of these issues that you have with concerns, but it is important to consider for safety purposes. So they're prime targets for SQL injection. In essence, somebody could go in, steal the data. Somebody could go in, modify the data, put in some kind of virus. Not very helpful to you. So on slide 36 here, I have provided an on-click display date and time example. So if you were to highlight this code, copy it and paste it into the WYSIWYG and click run, you'll get date and time as your header too. And this on-click that says, click me to display date and time, which is your text there. When you click, click me to display state and time, it will provide the exact date and time to the minute, to the second, and whatever your date type is. In this example, Eastern Daylight Time. So every time you run it, you click that button, it'll change on you. So comparatively speaking, JavaScript compared to HTML and cascading style sheets HTML helps us define the content of web pages, 
CSS allows us to specify the layout and JavaScript allows us to program the behavior. So basically I like to think of these as a house. HTML is your foundation. CSS is basically how you make the house look. And then JavaScript might be the little furniture you put inside your house. So another example here on slide 38 of an on-click, if you were to copy this code into the WYSIWYG and run, our button now says the time is. And we click that button and we have the same exact result. It gives us our exact time here. However, we all we really did was change the specific name or what was written in our on click button. Slide 39 does similar. However, on slide 40, you'll see examples of different types of events other than on click. You could have an on change which changes an element within HTML on mouse over something that does something when you scroll over something, et cetera, et cetera, as mentioned on the slides. So slides 41 and through 55, you're welcome to read on your own more information on the similarities between JavaScript and Java. But the main point is that JavaScript functions are going to have a start or in INIT, which is short for initialize or finish at the end, which is simply used as the destroy function. So on slide 56 here, you'll notice visually that you see how to create a multiplication table. We'll use JavaScript code within HTML to get two inputs. As you'll see on slide 57, we're asked how many columns for your multiplication table. You put in a number, you click OK. Then you're asked how many rows, you put in a number and click OK. If you go back to slide 56, click notes and copy all of that code into your WYSIWYG and run, you'll see here you're asked how many rows or how many, yes, how many rows? I put in nine, then how many columns? I'll put in nine again, click okay, and it gives me a nine by nine multiplication table. That is because our function is creating a table, rows by columns. We have an iterator which adds additional rows and additional columns based on the numbers you put in. And each time it's creating a table row based on your rows and table data, which is your columns. If you were to copy the code, which in within slide 58 as well, in the notes, you will create a form using JavaScript as needed as well. So if you copy that code here, and run, you'll now see you have the option to type in within all of these boxes. And as mentioned, the validate is primarily what we do with JavaScript here. Okay, the input type for password, the input type, et cetera. This validate function, when we click, cre click create, oh, please enter your first name, please enter your last name, please enter your email. Because you didn't put any information in there, you get these warning errors. However, the way this is set up right now, this information is only being stored 
in an array, not specifically on a page anymore. Now, slides 59 through 64 provide you with an in-class exercise. You're welcome to test out the code on your own to see if the pop-up works when you combine these within the WYSIWYG. So slide 35, we have a simple review of what we touched on with JavaScript. It's interpreted, not compiled. Java and other programming languages like Python are compiled. JavaScript is not. It's more relaxed syntax and rules than Java has, and it primarily focuses on one function doing one thing, whereas in Java, you can have a function do many different things. And you can embed it within HTML and CSS, as you've seen. Previously mentioned how to externally link script source equals file name, whatever it is, .js, and then the type is set to text slash JavaScript. Always put in the head, just like we did with our CSS external link. So as I touched on, the common use of JavaScript is usually that form validation that we just saw, but you can also embellish and create special effects. You can use it for basic math calculations, Dynamic content manipulation. Like I said, you could have somebody click something to change the text size or click something to specifically change the language being used. So here's slides 68 through 81 are advanced topics you're welcome to look through on your own. They provide you with more information on certain things you might use within JavaScript, certain languages. So the rest of our slides within this lesson provide us with different examples of other JavaScript options. So on slide 82 here, we're describing what an alert box is. In this example, an alert box is often used if you wanna make sure something comes through correctly to the user. So when an alert box pops up, the user will have to click okay to proceed. So if you were to copy this simple code, in your WYSIWYG, you click a button that says, try it. And all you get is an alert that says, I am an alert box. So you put in your code, you click run. Again, your button on click is set to say, try it. We click it. I am an alert box. You click okay. That is all our function does here. Creates an alert that says, I am an alert box. On slide 84 here, we are described what a confirm box is. It's often used if you want the user to verify or accept something. So you'll have two potential options that pop up, a button that says OK, a button that says cancel. In this example, if the user clicks OK, the box returns true. Otherwise, the box returns false. So if you were to copy the code from slide 85 in your WYSIWYG and run, You'll notice here that if you click OK, it's considered confirm. You pressed OK. Otherwise, if you click cancel, it says you clicked cancel. And a document get element demo spits out whatever choice you chose. So we run. Our on click says try it again for our button. We click it. We click OK. You pressed OK. I'll run it again. I'll click the try it button. And if you click cancel this time, it now says you press cancel. So you have an if, what happens if you press the button? If you pressed okay, it gives you the text okay. Otherwise, which is else, if you click the cancel button, your output now says you pressed cancel. On slide 86, we're described what a prompt box is. It's often used if you want the user to input a value before entering a page. Again, it has us click either OK or Cancel. If the user clicks OK in this instance, the box returns the input value. 
If the user clicks cancel, the box returns null. So on slide 87, if you copy this code in your WYSIWYG and select run, again, our button is called try it with the text try it listed there. We click try it. So it says, please enter your name. By default, the name Harry Potter is listed there. So if we click OK, it says, hello, Harry Potter. How are you today? That is because the prompt says, please enter your name. And by default, we've put in Harry Potter as our answer. Then if we click OK, which is our else here, we get the text, hello, plus person, which is whatever information you put in, whether it be Harry Potter or you change it, person, plus how are you today? And that's what shows up. So if we run this again and click try it and put in Bob Dole, for example, and click OK, now it says, hello, Bob Dole, how are you today? So it overwrote whatever that specific person is. So by default, it says Harry Potter, but you can write over it. Then if you were to click run, select the tryout button, and then click cancel, it says user canceled the prompt, which is what our null response is. Text user e canceled the prompt. Now on slide 88, if you were to copy this code in the WYSIWYG, you would have two input prompt example. In this example, you're asked, what is your favorite color? And how about your second favorite color? So if you do click run, it asks what your favorite color is. So I'll put in blue, okay. Then it asks what's your second favorite color is. You put silver. You click OK, and you get the output blue silver. That's because document.write, what's the favorite color, comma, we have space there, and then fave color two. So whatever two inputs you put in will be displayed out once you click OK. And then last but not least here, I have a simple on-click pop-up created using JavaScript as well. So if you were to copy this script code and put it in the header section and then your ahref into the body section within your WYSIWYG, like so, and click run, it simply says click here to visit my website, which is what we have the on click to be. Instead of having it as a button, we just have it set up as a basic pop-up. We use the this function you may remember from Java or Python.href, which tells us there's a hyperlink reference, which we've set above. So when we click on this website, because we've now set a pop-up window to create a pop-up, we click on this. It creates a pop-up height 300 by 700. And you could set that web link or URL or hyperlink reference to whatever specific website you want. So let's say I choose now to do ESPN.com. And now run that. I click on that and it now opens ESPN.com. So that is all our initial content for our first JavaScript lecture. And if you should have any questions, make sure to stop in on the Zoom meeting.